2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 6. Are you there? For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Father, as we are working on part two of our series of This Means War, I pray, God, that you would give us ears to hear what you're saying. God, give us eyes to see what you are doing and a heart that's soft and teachable and ready to change. In Jesus' name I pray. And somebody said amen. Bless you as you're seated this morning. So last week we started, we started a series uh, titled This Means War. And that's why we have ammo cans up here and and we kind of made a little makeshift bunker and and uh, we have camouflage all over the place just to kind of keep the theme. We we handed out anybody still have your your dog tag that says this means war. So we talked about last week. Let me just give you a little recap. We we talked about in the first week that we need to learn who we're fighting and that we're not fighting people. We're fighting the enemy, the devil, the spirit of this age. We need to understand who we're fighting and we're not fighting each other. Come on, somebody. But we're fighting Satan. I, I, I shared with you last week that your boss is not the Antichrist. Your spouse is not your enemy. Come on. I said this Thursday in my leadership class. Listen, we're on the same team. Could you imagine if we played basketball together? There's a five-man basketball team together, and, and the point guard is running the ball down the court, and then, this, and then the same guy that's supposed to be in the paint, the point guard goes to the three-point line and begins to shoot, and then all of us, and then, and then his, the guy that's in the paint jumps up and slaps the ball out of, out of the air when his player is trying to make a point. Well, that's what we're doing when we're fighting each other. Come on, somebody. And so the reason why many times we have problems in our relationships is because we keep fighting each other. And what we need to do is learn how to fight the devil. Come on and stop fighting each other. We're on the same team. We're on the same so, team. So when, when, we, when, we, when we look at this, we've got to realize that we're on the same team. And how dare us as Christians fight each other? We're not in competition with the Baptist church down the street. But we sure act like it. This isn't fries and Safeway. Besides, fries can't handle all the people that. Good. Mine says it's real good. I think. Mine. Not every church. Come on. Besides, if this whole city got saved, you wouldn't have enough seats in every church in town anyway. But you know what? Why none of our churches are completely full? Because the church, because the Christians are too busy fighting each other. Oh my God, I got to get back to my notes. I got to get back to my notes. We've got to learn who we're fighting, y'all. So Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he's telling a very carnal people in Corinth, a, a, a group of people in a very corrupt time of his writing. He's saying, listen, you can't fight in the flesh because your flesh isn't good. He says, listen, though we walk in the flesh, He's saying we live in the flesh. We do not war according to the flesh. Because listen, your flesh isn't good. It isn't holy. It isn't right. And, 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 and if you fight in the flesh, you will lose every single time. He's saying that, listen, our flesh is, is our carnal nature. It's not our godly nature. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, our spirit gets saved. Our flesh does not. Don't you wish our flesh could just get saved? Oh, um, uh, if our flesh could just get saved, but our flesh doesn't. But we have to learn how to put our flesh in subjection. We've got to learn how to how to fight the flesh. And and carnal carnal, I I I I love this word carnal carnal. It means governed by mere human nature and not governed by the spirit of God. 
And so Paul is writing to a bunch of carnal Christians. Do, can I tell you what the, most, what the most dangerous thing is in the church today? It is not Satan. It's carnal Christians. We expect to be wounded and hurt by the devil. By the way, that's his job. The devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. The most dangerous thing in the church today is not Satan because he's defeated. Come on. The scariest thing in the church today is carnal Christians because they hurt, they hurt babies. They hurt, Christ, they hurt baby Christians. They hurt people who, you know, you know, the, you know the, the, somebody told me here while back, they said, Pastor, I can't come to your church. I said, why not? They said, because there's too many hypocrites that come to your church. I said, I said, isn't that where they should be? Yeah. Well, then where should they be? But listen, we shouldn't be a hypocrite forever. We, we, we should be growing in the things of God. Come on. Listen, I know people who've been in church all their lives and are still carnal. Who are still led, so much led by their flesh. Come on. They go to every Bible study. They, they can quote scripture. They, they, know all, they know all kinds of stuff, but they're in the flesh. They'll beat you over their head with the Bible, but then, but then the, you turn around and they'll cut you. Come on, somebody. So, so he's saying, listen, we cannot live in the flesh and we cannot fight in the flesh. And that means living in the flesh is behaviors and attitudes that are characterized by living in the flesh, like indulging in sinful desires, engaging in fights and jealousies. What are you fighting for? Stop fighting. Stop it. Stop, stop fighting. Jealousy being controlled by worldly passions rather than by the Spirit of God. And I am convinced, listen to me, I am convinced that many of our problems are come, come from us living in the flesh. Many of our problems come from us living in the flesh. In fact, I think many times we give the enemy, we give the devil too much credit. Satan made, no, no, he didn't. No, he didn't. You just stepped out in the flesh. You haven't controlled your desires. You, you, haven't, you, you, you haven't learned how to control yourself. You want the benefits of Christianity, but you don't want the responsibility of Christianity to keep your mouth. The devil made me say it. No, he didn't. You opened up your mouth. He does not have control over your mouth. You have control over your mouth. Control over your mouth. The devil made me do it. No, he didn't. Well, the devil makes me speed down Canal Avenue. Come on, somebody. The devil made me drive 65 and a 45 and get me a ticket. The devil must hate me today. No, it's your... Yeah, it's your stupidity. Don't blame that on the devil. In fact, you're giving him too much credit. And I, think we give, I think we give that old sucker too much credit. And we need to stop giving him too much credit and start taking, oh my God, this is going to be really unpopular. We got to start taking responsibility for ourselves and stop making excuses. Well, I would come to church, but it's because you don't want to. Because if you want to do something bad enough, you'll do it. If you want something bad enough, you'll go get it. You'll do whatever you got to do to get whatever you got, what, what you want. You will do whatever you got to do to get whatever you want. Some of you are sitting next to those people that you wanted so bad that you did whatever you had to do. You had to squeeze into those banks. Stay out of my preaching. You had to, you had to, listen, listen, you had to get yourself in those spanks. You had to go to the shop to get them fake little... You went and got your hair did. You went and got your nails did. You did all this because you had to have that man. You did whatever you had to do. Come on, man. You brush your teeth extra. You shaved. You shined your shoes. 
You put on that extra, you put on that extra squirt of Old Spice. Come on, you're used to McDonald's, but you took her to Longhorn Steakhouse. Come on, somebody. You took your last three wives to McDonald's, but you're taking this, this future ex-wife. You took her to Longhorn. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. Stop. I'm getting so tired of people with excuses. If you want to do it, do it. Stop talking about it. In fact, talk is, have you ever heard the saying, talk is cheap? Talk is cheap. Talk is, talk is cheap. Well, I, well, I want to, well, then do it. Don't tell me you want to, just do it then. Be about it. Stop talking about it. Romans chapter 8, verse 5 through 8. Ugh. Romans chapter 8, my goodness. That whole chapter, I struggled with it this week, f figuring out which verses I was going to use in Romans 8 because OMG. Romans 8, 5 through 8. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded or fleshly minded is death. Death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity or an enemy against God for it is not subject to the law of God nor indeed can be. So then those who live are in the flesh, so those who are in the flesh cannot please God. He's talking to the church, y'all. He's not talking to sinners. He's talking to church folk. He's talking to church that if you live in the flesh, you cannot please God. Who Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 through 8. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. See, okay, fornication, fornication is what? Fornication is having sex outside of marriage before marriage. Adultery is having sex with someone outside of your marriage while you're married. Fornication is having sex before marriage. Hello? It's because, so, so let's, let's break it down a little bit. For, so this fornication, what you're doing is you're putting, you're putting your fleshly desires before You got me now? That's why he said, that's why he says, listen, that's why he calls it idolatry, because idolatry, idolatry is defined as this. It listen, it's not, it's not creating a shrine and worshiping it. It's any idolatry is putting anything, anything in your life, anything in your life before God. That is idolatry. So if you put so so mamas, if you put your children before God, you're idolizing your children. And you're putting them before God, and that's living in the flesh. If you put your listen, if you put your job and your money before God, that's idolatry. You're idolizing your money. Un uncleanness being means take a shower. I'm just kidding. Passions. You're putting your passions before the things of God. That's idolatry. Evil desire. Do we need to go there? Covetousness, what's covetousness? Envy, jealousy, right? Because you're putting your things before God. Because these, because of these things, because of uncleanliness, fornication, passion, evil desire, and jealousy, right? That's idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off these. Put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, and filthy language out of your mouth. Hello? He's saying, listen, you need to, you need to, you need to, you need to learn how to, how to not play with your flesh. You need to kill it. 
You need to kill it. And the, and the way that you kill it, uh, we're going to get into that. I, I, like, I, I like what this version says. In the New Living, it says this. Let's go a little further. So it says, put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of the world, but now it is time to get rid of anger, rage, malice, behavior, slander, and dirty language. Come on, somebody needs to clean up their mouth today. Well, pastor, that's just the way I talk. No, your heart's dirty. Because out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. Your mouth is just declaring what's in your heart. Come on, somebody. I just don't like what comes out of my mouth. Then you really shouldn't like what's in your heart. I'm just going to go ahead and preach it like I want to this morning. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all of its wickedness, wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. Verse 11, in this new life, anybody got a new life this morning? It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us. Since you chose to be a holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercies, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Verse 13, make allowance for each other's fault. And forgive anyone who offends you. Oh, I wish I could camp on that spot right there. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perf har perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts, for as members of one body, you're called to live in peace and always be thankful. I, listen to me, I am convinced this morning that you cannot fight the enemy and defeat him if you're still enjoying his company. You cannot fight the enemy and defeat him if you still enjoy his company. Listen, you can't play with the devil on Saturday night and come to church on Sunday morning and expect that everything be all right. You will go straight to hell. Can I say it how I feel it this morning and how I read it this morning? I think he's preaching kind of hard. Well, buckle up, girlfriend, because I ain't done yet. I'm only on page four of six. This flesh, this, this flesh that we've got to, and we're, 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 supposed to, we're supposed to take territory. We're supposed to fight and occupy till he comes. But if we're so busy, this means war. And if we're so busy fighting our flesh and fighting each other, that's why the church isn't the victorious place that Christ has called it to be, because we're so busy fighting ourselves and, fight, and fighting other people and, placate, and playing with our flesh. Because we live in a culture today that says, if it feels good, just do it, boo. You just be you. What's your truth? I don't really care what your truth is. Is it the truth or is it not? Yeah. Is it what God has to say? And that has to be our litmus test. Listen to me. That has to be our litmus test is what does the word of God say? What does the word of God say? And everything else, let it be a liar. Come on, we've got to, we've, well, pastor, I just feel like I don't care how you feel. I don't care how you feel. And the reason why I don't care how you feel is this, because your feelings will lie to you. Can I talk to somebody this morning? Your feelings will lie to you. Some days you want to be married. Some days you want to kill them. Some days you want to have children. Some days you just like to give them away to somebody else. For years, my family has worked National Adoption Day in Pinal County. Last year, 61 kids 
got adopted in Pinal County into Forever Homes, and we got to go and be a part of this celebration the first Saturday of November every year for the last, I don't know, 18 or 19 years. We have been a part of this, and, and I've got to pray with families and talk to families and encourage them, and, and we give them supplies and things to help with, with Adoption Day, and, and we have a team that, that, has, that, that makes quilts for every kid that's being adopted and gift certificates and gift cards and all kinds of great stuff that we're able to do to kids that are being adopted into forever homes. Come on, somebody. That is so, so very cool. But you know what? There has been a few of those adoption days that I wanted to, I, I walked up to the registration table with my two boys because they serve and they volunteer there as well. And I said, hi, I'd like to register my name. And I've got two of them that I'd like to adopt today. And she looked at me, she said, Pastor Edwards, that's not how this works today. We are adopting children out. I said, well, you can't take two more. And they said, no, we can't take two more. She said, I'm sorry, you're going to have to keep those two. And by the way, here's the volunteer t-shirts. Get busy. Come on. Your flesh is fickle. Your flesh will lie to you. Your flesh will tell you, you don't need to come to church this morning. You can just take the day off. Your flesh will say, you know what? I'm going to call in Monday. I'm, I'm sick of this. I got sick of this. Your boss says, well, George, what's, what's wrong with you? Uh, I got sick of this. Is that a new, is that like COVID-19? Yeah, it's, it's, it's called a sick of this 2024. Yeah, what are, your, what are your symptoms? Well, I'm sick of you. I'm sick of her. I'm sick of them. I'm, I, I'm, I'm sick of everything. I'm just sick of, I'm sick of it all. I'm just going to have a, I'm going to have a mental health day. Your flesh says don't go to work, but your spirit is going to say you need to pay your bills. And you need to be responsible and pay your bills. And you need to take care of your family because my Bible says that if a man don't work, he don't eat. Oh, oh, oh no, oh, now. But no, but now we just give everybody everything because they, they, beg for what they, they beg for what they need, but they buy whatever they want because we're appealing to their flesh. So let's give them a cell phone and let's pay their bills and let's pay their water bill and their electricity bill and their car bill and their car. Well, well, you got a job? Are you working? Do you, are your legs broke? It got quiet in here, didn't it? Instead, we just appeal to everybody's flesh and placate their flesh. Well, we're just going to tiptoe around Susie because she's easily offended. No, she needs to get her life right in Jesus' name. Stop wearing her emotions on her sleeve and find out that everything is going to be all right, but she's going to have to line up with the word of God and stop being so nasty. Come on, come on. Well, well, you know, I don't, I don't know if I should talk to him today or not because, because, you know, he, he might be in a bad. Do you ever know people who are just on a roller coaster? You don't know what you're going to get one day. They're great. And one day they're. One day they're the devil. And the next day they're an angel. Come on, somebody. It's because they're, they're living out by their flesh. How are you? Oh, I'm horrible. I'm... Mm -hmm. Listen, I'm tired of being around Eeyore. I love, I, I love, I love Winnie the Pooh. I used to look like Winnie the Pooh. Somebody? I even had the red shirt and everything. I don't like Eeyore. And I, listen, the rest of my life, I refuse to be around Eeyores. Dumb donkeys? I want to be around some tiggers. Tiggers that are happy. Tiggers happy about everything. Come on, he's, just, he's got a spring in his step. He's got a spring in his tail. He's happy. Come on, be happy. Stop it. There's too many Eeyores in the church today. How are you? I was just at the coffee pot. I just was saying a salutation to you this morning and saying hi, and you vomited all over me. Most of the time, I don't hang out at the coffee pot on Sunday mornings before church. You know why? Because I got to come up here and preach the word of God, and I don't want you to vomit on me all over the table out there and bring all your negativity to the pulpit with me. 
Well, pastor must think that he's too good for everybody else. No, I just don't want you to vomit on me before I try to give the word of God. Because it takes a while to get vomit off your shirt. Come on, somebody. We got to do better, y'all. Always grumpy about something, always complaining about something. Because I have learned that you'll, you'll find what you're looking for. You'll find what you're looking for. If you want to find a problem here, you don't have to look any further than me. Not the holes in the parking lot. Not the smells in the bathroom. Look to me. I will fail you because I'm a man. And so if you're looking for a failure, just call me Pastor Failure. Come on. But if you want to find negative stuff, you'll find negative stuff. But what are you looking for? Get your flesh. He says, listen, you put your flesh under subjection. You put your flesh under control. Well, if the Lord wants to take it from me, stop it. You really think he's going to? I remember somebody tell me years and years and years ago, years and years and years and years ago. Now she's bedridden and has emphysema. If the Lord wants to take smoking away from me, he'll take it from me. Been smoking for 50 years. Still. Before long, should be, hello, Roy, how are you? Well, when the Lord decides to take it away from me, he'll get your flesh under control. If the Lord wants to take this cussing spirit out of me, he'll. flesh. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, the flesh is a bundle of appetites. And unless you fight the flesh, you will be overcome by its desires. Psalm chapter 91. Psalm chapter 91. We're going to start in verse 9. The whole thing is good. Psalm 91, but I'm going to, I'm going to start in verse 9. Psalm 91, verse 9, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him and I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Oh, so stinking good. I've got to tell you, though, in this, he says, listen, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. Let, let, let me teach you something. We've got to learn how to not expose ourselves. Watch this. Watch this. Let's go up to verse. Let's go up to up to verse four. He says this. He shall cover you with his feathers. And under his wings, you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Look at this. Look at this picture. Hopefully we have it. Maybe not. We don't have it. Let me give you the description then. I have a picture. It'll be there. So you have to come back for the 11 o'clock to see my picture. There's a picture of a duck with her, a, a mama duck. What's a mama duck called? Duck. Mama duck. In Spanish, it's called ducka. A male duck is called a ducko, but a female duck is called a ducka. So a mama duck, a mama duck is there and she's got her feathers out like this. She's got her wings out like this. And she's got a bunch of, a bunch of baby ducks underneath underneath her underneath her wings underneath her 
her, her feathers. And, 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 and he says, listen, he shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. Because verse nine says he'll do these things. Why? Because you have made the Lord God your dwelling place. I, I, I looked at that word in, in the Hebrew, what, what dwelling place means, and it means a habitation. It means, listen to me, it means that dwelling place, it means a habitation, it means a, a continual place of residence. It's not, just, listen to me now, it's not just a place that you run to when you get into trouble. Listen to me. It's not just a place you run to when you get into trouble. It is a place that you inhabit. It is a place that you occupy at all times. A refuge, an abode, and a retreat. And listen, listen, God is saying like this, that he, in essence, is like that duck, like that bird, like that chicken, right, that has his wings out, and we get under his wings, and we are safe from, from the storm. We're safe from predators. Have you ever been around a mama, a mama trying to protect her children? They say one of the most deadly things you could do is get between a mama, a mama bear and her cubs. Listen, I'd like to see one of you try to get in between, between my, my wife and her boys. My wife is five foot tall, weighs 120 pounds, and she would tear you up if you messed with one of her children. And I would, I would pay good money to watch it. You thought that UFC 300 fight last night was good. Honey, you ain't seen nothing yet. I, in fact, I think Dana White would come to the church to try to sign her up. He says that he would do these things because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. But listen, I got to tell you this morning this, that if you keep running outside of God's protection because of your flesh, it will leave you vulnerable. And we're talking about a war here. If you keep running outside of God's protection, it leaves you vulnerable. Your flesh is a mess and it will leave you out. And you've got to get in and learn how to stay in. I've got to learn how to get under God's wing and then stay under God's wing. And nothing in the name of Jesus is going to let me outside of his wings. Because once I get outside of his protection, I am vulnerable. I'm vulnerable to storms and I'm vulnerable to predators. Because can I tell somebody something this morning? That, 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 that storms are going to come. And if you're not in a storm, if you're not going through a storm now, a storm is coming. And if you get outside of God's wings, outside of God's protection, it will leave you vulnerable to the elements. You've got, to, you've got to learn how to get in and stay in. I am under his wings, and I'm not going to do anything to get out because I'm vulnerable to the storms, and I'm vulnerable to predators because there is an enemy of our soul that is roaring like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. May means possible. He doesn't have to devour you, but he will if you get outside of his protection. That's, that's why it's so key. When you get in church, you better stay in church. Let me say it like this. You better get your butt in church and stay in church. I, I mentioned this Thursday in my leadership class that, that it's so cool. That, has anybody ever watched documentaries like, like, like nature shows, nature documentaries? I love them. And, and I was watching one recently uh, about a lion that was, that was hiding in some high grass. And he was watching a huge herd of, of, of zebras. And, and they're all together. And, and how God's design, God's design is so cool. He makes this pattern on this zebra that when they're all together, it confuses the enemy because the, because the lines get all blurry and it messes with the lion's eyes. And so the lion, the lion doesn't focus on the herd. The lion sits in the tall grass and he waits until one or two get out all by themselves. He waits until they get alone. Come on, somebody. And then when they, and they're usually a little weaker, they're usually probably not as, they're probably, did I say that? I did, didn't I? You know, their elevator doesn't go all the way to the top. You know what I'm saying? They're a silent short of a picnic. Come on. They're a fry short of a happy meal. You know what I'm saying? 
They're not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I could keep going. He doesn't go after the herd. He goes after the ones that isolate themselves, who get, who get out from underneath the protection of the herd. Because listen, when the herd, listen to me, when the herd is, when, and when they, when they catch the scent of the lion, they all start to run together. And the lion is sitting in the grass going, I don't even know what that is. I'm just going to stay right here in the grass. But when he sees the one, the, you know, the do the do one off by himself, thinking that I can do this all by myself, I can do it on my own, I don't need, I don't need the herd. I, you know, in fact, I think this, mm, Jesus, I think this grass over here might be just a little bit greener. Oh, God. Ooh, I, I know I'm supposed to be over there, but my flesh says I'd rather be over here, you know, because I do my own thing. I, I'm, 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 I'm independent, you know, I'll do my own thing. And your independence will kill you, little zebra. And can I tell somebody this morning who has a little independent spirit inside of them, you need to get it out of you in the name of Jesus. In fact, you're supposed to be dependent on Jesus, and you ought to be dependent on the church, too. Well, you know, I, you know, church just ain't my thing. Well, honey, it better start to be your thing, because if you do make it to heaven, you're going to be with the church the rest of eternity. And so, so if you don't like the church, then you ain't going to like heaven. If you don't like the church, you ain't going to like heaven because the church is going to be there. I just don't like the church. Well, then you're going to hell. I just don't like the church. Then you're going to hell. You know, with all those people, who do you think is going to be in heaven? Oh. You know, this organized religion. Uh, there's going to be a great organized religion in heaven, and it's going to be a bunch of blood-bought saints who were in love with the church. Because can I just tell you something? Jesus came and died. And he said, he said, I think he said something around mm, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. It's upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Yeah. What? Come on. I just, I just don't like organized church. Honey, heaven is going to be an organized church. And can I tell somebody too? There's not going to be a Pentecostal section. There's not going to be a Baptist section. There's not going to be a there's not going to be a Presbyterian section. There's not going to be a Lutheran section. It's going to be a bunch of blood bought saints. And I am just convinced, and listen to me, and I'm just convinced that I'm going to make somebody mad, and it's okay because I don't live off your praise anyway. Is Because if I live off your praise, then I'll die by your criticism. My Savior. I just believe that, I just believe that Christians should be crazy about the church because we should be crazy about the things that Jesus is crazy about, and Jesus is crazy about his church. <laughs> And so we should learn how to start being crazy about start being crazy in love with his church because he is crazy in love with his church. In fact, I believe that First Thessalonians says something in around verse four or chapter four, or around sixteen through eighteen that says he's coming back for a church without spot and without blemish. Come on, somebody, he's coming back for a church. And it's not stucco, it's not lumber, it's not carpet, it's not pews. It's people, it's folk. So if you got a problem with folk, you got a problem with God. In fact, in fact, first John says that if you don't like people, then you don't love God. Amen. Come on. Come on. Well, Pastor, the problem I got with the church is all those people. Well, if you hate if you hate people and you say you love God, the Bible says you're a liar. That's true. Oh, I'm just preaching now. I'm just I'm just Amen. preaching now. A habitation. So, so listen, I got to tell somebody today that you need to learn how to quit running and settle into the protection of God. Settle into the protection of God and stop fighting. Well, I don't think the church needs my money. It don't. The church don't need your money. Can I tell you that? 
Come on, come on. The church don't need your money. Hello. Ah, he's serious now, Janet. He rolled up his sleeves. The church don't need your money. You need to give your they didn't they didn't they didn't the church don't need your money but you need to give your money come on see that's our flesh the church needs me honey let me just tell you something we did it before you just fine and we'll do it just after you just fine too <laughs> somebody 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 recently told me well pastor you need me in this church I told him, I said, we did just fine before you, sir, and we'll do just fine without you. Everybody is replaceable. And when you start thinking that you're all that in a bag of chips, uh, last I heard is pride comes before. So you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. Quit. Quit, quit running, quit running and settle into the protection of God. Stop fighting, stop fighting and learn how to say no to your flesh. I love, I, I know I gotta, I gotta, I gotta stop, sweet Jesus. But I look, I looked, I looked up this morning during worship because the Lord kept dropping more and more scriptures into me about flesh. John, or I'm sorry, Luke chapter four. This isn't my notes, boys, just flow with me. Luke chapter four. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. Okay, he's been fasting. He's hungry. Hadn't eaten nothing in 40 days. Out in the wilderness all by himself. He's hungry. Verse 3. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. Okay, wait. Jesus, fully God, fully man, was hungry. Isn't it just like the devil to tempt you by something that you want? Because listen, the devil cannot tempt you by something that you do not want. Listen, the devil cannot make me get off of my diet with Brussels sprouts. I am not going to ruin my diet today if someone comes to me and says, I'd like to give you some boiled. There are just, there's, there's a couple of things in this world that should not exist. And one of them is Brussels sprouts and men with man buns. There's just some things, y'all, that just shouldn't be so. There's just some things that should not be so. Man buns and Brussels sprouts. Maybe not. Maybe I'm gonna get me a. Maybe I'm gonna get me a. Maybe I'm gonna get me a, a man bun. Cover up my solar panel. Come on, somebody. But you ain't gonna tempt me by something I don't want. But you can tempt me by something I really do want. Pastor, I, I know that you're fasting, but I'd love to I'd love to have you come over to my house and and I'm on my barbecue, a filet mignon cooked medium with a side of asparagus and garlic mashed potatoes and some croissant rolls fresh out of the oven that my wife homemade. And then she's got some cherry, homemade cherry cheesecake and some sweet tea. And I've been 39 days on a water fast. Come on. The devil knew that Jesus was hungry and he needs something to feed his body with. And he said, listen, if you call yourself the son of God, if you say who you really say you are, if you really are who you say you are, then speak to this stone and cause it to become bread. And then Jesus said this in verse four. He said, listen, but Jesus answered him saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And then if we keep looking the story, he keeps tempting Jesus. 
And Jesus kept fighting him back saying, listen, the word of God says, if you're going to beat your flesh and to learn how to beat the enemy of your life, you're going to have to learn how to use the word to do it. In fact, it was so implicit to me. It was so important. Jesus knew fully God, fully man. He knew that he was going to have to fight the enemy and he was going to do it with the word of God. It wasn't like, well, my pastor said. Well, my grandma said, my, my so-and-so said, who cares what grandma said? Grandma was crazy. Grandma dipped and she cussed. Come on, somebody. Come on, y'all. No. What does the word of God say? This is how I'm going to defeat the enemy. Jesus knew it the best. He said, listen, it is written. But our flesh, our flesh says, no, just do what feels right. Do what feels good. Some of us never pick up our Bible until it's Sunday morning. How you think you're going to, how you think you're going to cause a war? How you think you're going to stand up and fight the enemy when you don't even know the word of God? And listen, you must learn how to quote more than just John 3.16. Yeah. If you're just eating on Sunday morning, you're malnourished. Hello? I'm gonna nourish my soul. And as I nourish, and I nourish my as I nourish my soul with the word of God, guess what? The word of God will deal with my flesh. Yeah. And my flesh does not like the Bible, by the way. Can I just tell you somebody, my flesh does not like the Bible. In fact, I will try to come up with every kind of excuse. Because this is offensive. This is uncomfortable. This will make me shut up and repent and apologize. It'll make me sit down. Come on. Oh, you know what? And us Pentecostal people are the worst because we just want to get up and shout. But what about shutting up and sitting down? Listen, I would much rather have a church that sits down and shuts up. Listen, I told, listen I, I've even told my denomination this, that I will not pastor a Rice Krispie church. I will not pastor a Rice Krispie church. You know what a Rice Krispie church is? You know, Rice Krispies, when you put them, when you take them out of the cereal box and you put it in the milk and they snap, crackle and pop. But after they get in the milk a while, they're soggy and they're a nasty mess. Have you ever eaten? Have you ever eaten? Have you ever just poured a bowl and gotten taken a phone call or something or had to run to the bathroom or get something else from the kitchen and you let those Rice Krispies sit for a minute in the milk? It's a nasty, disgusting glop of mess. Yeah, they snap, crackle, and pop, and they look real good. But if you don't eat it real quick, they're nasty. And listen, I know a bunch of people who snap, pack, snap crackle, and pop during church, but then they sit in the milk, you, you let them sit in the milk for a little while, and they're nasty. And I refuse to pastor those kind of people. They'll come for a while, but they won't stay long. Because they want to get up and dance and shout and scream and fall on the floor and bark like a dog. That's fine, but you better get up transformed. You can bark like a dog and speak in tongues all you want, but you better get up off that floor transformed. If you're not, I'm not going to let you keep doing that mess. I'll let you do it a time or two, and I'm going to watch your life. Because, listen, there's way too many snap, crackle, and pop churches that have a lot of pop and a lot of fizz and a lot of fizzle. But, listen, when they come through a trial, let's see what happens. When life begins, when Satan comes to them and says, listen, if you say who you are, why don't you turn this, piece, this stone into a piece of bread? And they go, well, my own, and, you know, and, they play, and they start playing with the devil some. Because you cannot defeat him if you keep playing with him. And some of us in the name of Jesus need to stop playing with the devil come on, come on. Amen. and expecting God to bless you because God is not. I got to tell somebody this morning this. It's probably it's probably on YouTube. Not anybody here. I'm sure. I'm sure it's them. It's those people. Not you. Not you. God is not obligated to bless your mess. God is not obligated to bless your mess. You better clean it up. Well, pastor, I can't clean it up. Yes, you can. He says to put off the old man. He says, he says, who put off the old man? He did not say, I will put off the old man. He said, you put off the old man. He said, you put it off. No temptation. 
No temptation will overcome you, but God will give you a way of escape so that man, man, no man is tempted beyond what he's able. So that means I can resist temptation in the name of Jesus and I don't have to give in to my flesh. I can say no when old girl calls. I probably shouldn't even have her number in there and I should let her go to voicemail and then block her. I need to learn how to, well, I, I could talk about some plan B's today, but we ain't gonna talk about plan B. Oh, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta stop. I gotta stop making excuses for my flesh and learn how to deal with my flesh. And that's through the word of God and through the spirit of God. That's what I've got to do. Listen, the takeaway is this. Number one, I've got to stop giving into the flesh. Come on. My word for you today through the Holy Spirit is this. Stop it. Number two, overcome your flesh by getting real. Right? Stop making excuses. Number three. I love this. Make Jesus your dwelling place. Because he wants you this morning. Listen to me. He wants you this morning to come under his wing and to come out from the storm and to be protected by predators, protected from predators. But as long as you keep running out, you're vulnerable. God, help us today in the matchless name of Jesus. To deal thoroughly, God, with our flesh. We've all got it. But some of us like it more than others. I pray, oh God, in Jesus' matchless name, that you'll help us this morning to deal with our flesh. Lord, help me to deal with my flesh. Lord, we will not give in. We will not live by the flesh. But Lord, in the name of Jesus, we will live by the Spirit. Like, like Romans 8 says, we will not fulfill the desires of our flesh. We will walk in the spirit in the name of Jesus. And Lord, when we attack the enemy, because we realize that this is war, we're right in the middle of a war for our flesh, for our very spirit, for our very existence. God will be like Jesus in Luke 4. When Satan comes to tempt us, it is written. It is written. God, give us a hunger for your word. To Lord, to hide your word deep inside our heart. Like the psalmist said, David, like David said, Lord, let me hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Help us, God, in the name of Jesus to, to get your word down deep in our spirit, God. Give us a hunger. Give us a thirst. Give us a desire, God, for your word like never before. And God, I'll be quick to give you thanks and praise for the change that's coming in our lives as we surrender and we crucify this flesh in us. Help us, God, in Jesus' name. Maybe you're here, maybe you're watching, maybe you're listening this morning and you say, Pastor, I need to get right with Jesus today. I need Jesus to come into my heart and I need him to save me and forgive me of my sins and Maybe you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart. And you'd say, I'd like to give Jesus a try. I I'd like to invite him into my heart. I, I need to make sure that I'm going to make it to heaven. And I'm not so sure today. Right where you are today. I believe that the Holy Spirit is knocking on the doorpost of your heart. And he's telling you it's time. So if you're here, would you just pop up your hand right where you are? I just want to pray for you this morning. Is there anybody here? Say, yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Hallelujah. Anybody else? Anybody else? Amen. This is what I want you to do. We're going to pray this simple prayer. I love Romans 10. He says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we're going to call upon him this morning and we're going to pray it like this. And the whole church is going to help you that raised your hand. We're going to help you. We're going to pray it too. We're going to say, Lord Jesus, I ask you right now to come into my heart and save me. Forgive me of my sins and wash me clean and help me to follow you all the days of my life in Jesus name. Amen. And amen. You received that this morning.